China has not been having a good year. Between extended lockdowns, real estate market collapses, banking crises, trade wars, food insecurity and an unusually high level of civil unrest, it's starting to look like the once invincible CCP is forming cracks. Look, I know it's fun to speculate the demise of a regime that has done some terrible things, but now is probably the time to remember that just because we want something to be true doesn't mean that it is. It's easy to see why news stories, articles and so many YouTube videos speculating about how many days left until China collapses is getting so much attention. But if you hadn't guessed already, it's probably not going to happen. At least not in X number of days. We also shouldn't be hoping for it to happen. As cathartic as the idea of our biggest global rival imploding might be, we also have to realise that this would be good news to nobody. And I'm not just talking about the 1.5 billion mostly innocent people living their lives and raising their families in China, I'm also talking about all of us that depend on a delicate global finance and trade system which would not react well to the second largest player falling into disarray. To make sense of these frankly very clickbaity titles, we must as always understand a few important things. So why is everyone suddenly predicting that China is on the brink of collapse? What are the chances that these predictions will actually come true? And finally, why is this most likely totally overblown? This episode of Economics Explained was brought to you by Brilliant, the best online tool to teach yourself science, technology, engineering and math. I think there is a big difference between just learning something and truly understanding something. I could tell you that a launched object will fly through the air in the shape of a parabola and you could repeat that factoid back to me so I guess you would have technically learnt it. But would you remember it and would you understand why? Would you be able to tell me what would happen if we changed any of the variables in our perfect model? If instead you understood the interplay of forces acting on that object, you could tell me what shape it would make as it flew through the air. And you could also tell me what would happen if we launched the object in space or underwater or without gravity. That is understanding, and you will remember things that you understand for a lot longer than things that you merely learnt. Brilliant's interactive courses are structured in such a way as to make sure that you are understanding the subject as you go. To get started for free, go to brilliant.org slash economics explained, or click the link in the description below, and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Now before I get into China's apparent collapse, I want to do two things. The first is to give the standard big disclaimer that internal Chinese economic figures are extremely unreliable and in multiple instances have been found to be altered by authorities to present the nation's economic situation in a more positive light. The other thing I want to mention is that while I was researching and writing this video I noticed that another smaller economics YouTuber by the name of Money and Macro made a very similar video. For the most part we have explored completely separate issues within the bigger theme of this collapse narrative. But I want to mention his work anyway because he is great at calling out journalists and YouTubers on their nonsense, including myself in the past. Although I think I got the last laugh on that inflation situation. Alright, now that that's out of the way, China's economy has not been having a very good time recently for a laundry list of reasons that I think are worth addressing individually. Most recently it has had record heatwaves and droughts. Heatwaves in any country are bad news, but China is uniquely unprepared to deal with them. Most of their industrial capacity comes from city centres which have effectively had to shut down due to extreme heat causing conditions that make it difficult to go outside, let alone perform physical work in the nation's factories. Droughts are also bad news for the economy. Now the situation on the ground is probably not as bad as people are saying. Nobody is going to run out of drinking water. People don't drink municipal water in China anyway. But water supply issues are going to have real impacts in other areas. Industry in China is heavily concentrated along its rivers, primarily the Yangtze, which is a waterway that has 175 cities built along its banks. If the Yangtze River was a sovereign nation, it would be the third largest economy in the world after the United States and of course China itself. The river is running dry along certain crucial sectors which is directly interfering with hydroelectric power stations, regular power stations that need the water for cooling, internal shipping up and down the waterway, waste management as sewage and industrial runoff becomes more concentrated, and of course, farming. China is a very arable country with a lot of productive farmland, but it also has a lot of mouths to feed. As a country, it still relies on food imports to feed its large population. International food markets have seen the price of staples like grains, rice and proteins skyrocket in the wake of agricultural slowdowns, general inflation as well as the war taking place between Russia and Ukraine, two of the top 10 largest wheat producing nations in the world. 
In a cruel twist of irony, China was already struggling with food production this year because of flooding. Now again, I want to emphasise that the population isn't likely to starve in China because of these food shortages, at least not for the next 27 days or whatever. But feeding families is going to become a lot more expensive, especially for cultural staples like pork, which is actually where a good portion of grain production in China ends up. It's important to remember that while Chinese citizens are much richer than they were even a decade ago, it's still a very poor country by Western standards, with the average urban worker earning just $14,000 per year and rural farmers earning far less than that. If you are the majority of my audience from an advanced economy and have been struggling with food prices yourself, just imagine how difficult it is for a population with significantly less disposable income. There is an old saying that a society is just three missed meals away from total collapse, and perhaps we are starting to see a toned down version of this already. Again, nobody is starving, but when people have to start making decisions and sacrifices to feed their families, unprecedented civil unrest is easy to sympathise with. Now, if food and water shortages weren't enough, there is also the ongoing issue with housing and jobs. I first made a video on China's debt crisis a little over a year ago. Since then, things have only become worse. There were of course the issues with Chinese property developers that threatened to leave millions of people without their properties that they had already paid for, and while the government has thus far managed to contain that issue, it's not changing the fact that China's biggest industry is built on pillars of sand. It's very easy to grow an economy through a combination of low-cost manufacturing, government stimulus through infrastructure, and building houses to supply an ever more speculative market. The problem is that while this strategy might be extremely effective in the short term, it's unsustainable in the long term. Trying to grow an economy by exploiting these three factors is like trying to become an athlete by giving yourself an IV drip of five hour energy. You might very well break the 100 meter dash world record, but your heart is probably going to explode before you finish a marathon. Very simply, low cost manufacturing in China has made the country lots of money. The Chinese population is still not rich by western standards, but their incomes are many multiples of what they were even a decade ago. This means that their cost competitiveness is not as strong as it once was, and manufacturers are now looking to other options like Vietnam, India, Indonesia, and even America. Obviously, American factory workers demand much higher wages than Chinese factory workers, but shipping has been extremely expensive recently. In July of 2021, it costs around $2,500 to send a 40-foot shipping container from Shanghai to Los Angeles. In July of this year, that price was $20,000. The average factory worker is going to produce more than two shipping containers worth of product every year, which means that even if American companies have to pay their workers $35,000 a year more, they would still come out ahead. They would be saving money while also having the benefit of shorter and less complicated supply lines and being able to say that their product is made in America. In the past, the middle income trap as this phenomenon is known has been dismissed in China's case because low labour costs were just a small part of what made Chinese manufacturing so competitive. The country had also benefited from lax laws around environmental impacts, cheap shipping through massive economies of scale, a relatively skilled workforce, low standards for working conditions, and technical agglomeration. Technical agglomeration is the benefit that businesses get from being close to other businesses in the same industry. If suppliers, workers, consultants, customers, and even competitors are very close together, then it encourages the sharing of components, skills, ideas, feedback, and competition respectively. Cities like Shanghai, Shenzhen, Chongqing, and Guangzhou all benefit greatly from being bustling hubs of business activity. Or at least, they did. But the trade wars, extended lockdowns, and heatwaves we explored earlier are all putting a massive damper on this business activity, which has the potential to snowball rapidly because the benefits of agglomeration require a critical mass of activity. As soon as some business dries up, the rest quickly follow. But maybe I've made the same mistake that a lot of economists do when they are assessing China's economy which is to assume that they are still an economy directly dependent on mercantilist trade performance. While exports are obviously still a very large part of China's economy, it also has a domestic market, which, like most economies, accounts for a majority of its output. The problem it's facing here, though, is that a large portion of that output has come in the form of housing and infrastructure. Infrastructure spending is a great way to stimulate an economy. To build roads, railways, bridges, and all of the stuff that China's been building on mass in the past three decades, you need to employ a lot of people and spend a lot of money. This gives money directly to workers and businesses in the same way as direct stimulus like tax breaks or stimulus checks. But it also has the added benefit of creating something that will continue to add value to the economy for years and decades to come. Sounds great. But if you have already watched my video on China's $850 billion trains to nowhere, you'll know that you can't do this endlessly. 
Effective stimulus has to be performed account of the cyclical boom and bust nature of economies. Governments should apply stimulus when an economy is facing a downturn, and they should ease up or even reverse stimulus efforts when an economy is going very well. China has basically been putting the infrastructure stimulus accelerator to the floor for the past two decades, and has been pushing harder still since the GFC. This has meant that they have been able to build a lot of impressive things and make a lot of impressive headlines, but they've been doing it all while spending a lot of money during a time when they really didn't need to be. They have also now run out of things to build. Almost every possible piece of infrastructure that made sense to build in China has already been built. That means that now the government has been forced to rip up and redo perfectly good projects or build stuff in areas that don't really need it. You have all probably heard about China's ghost cities. Developments with thousands of apartments but nobody living in them. Well, all of those ghost cities have ghost road networks, ghost utilities and ghost public services too. Worse than simply providing no benefit, this infrastructure is an ongoing liability because it needs to be maintained and in many cases it was funded through municipal borrowing. A big motivating factor of China's Belt and Road Initiative is that it could continue its infrastructure spending in areas that would actually genuinely benefit from it. China invested heavily into developing nations in Southeast Asia and Africa by giving big loans from state-owned banks to smaller governments to fund the construction of ports, railroads and other trading-focused capital. Of the 54 countries in Africa, 49 have infrastructure loans from China. The loans were generally given on the condition that construction would be done largely or exclusively by Chinese companies using Chinese workers so that the Chinese economy would still benefit from the stimulating effects of government expenditure. Of course, if China builds a port in Africa, it does not benefit from the added efficiency that that port provides to the economy apart from opening up a new trading partner. Which isn't insignificant, but it is still not as good as building a much needed port in their own country if their country had a need for any ports. By investing in infrastructure in foreign countries though, the Chinese government substitutes domestic market efficiency for a stream of income in the form of loan repayments. This means that it gets to put money into the pockets of its workers while getting itself a new trading partner and spreading its economic influence all without actually needing to spend any money in the long term because it will all be repaid to them. Except that it hasn't been. China has had to forgive a huge amount of these loans because the governments that they loaned the money to were unwilling or in most cases unable to pay them back. This can be for a number of reasons. At the end of the day, most African economies are very small and unstable, but in a lot of cases these defaults are coming as the result of the infrastructure spending not providing the benefits it was promised to, either because it was poorly planned, poorly constructed, or never finished. In fairness, China has been generous with these loan forgiveness initiatives, but that has normally come on the proviso that the indebted nations fall in line with support for China on its more controversial international ambitions. Now unpaid loans lead us nicely onto housing. China is heavily overexposed to real estate. In the US, housing contributes about 15 to 18% to the country's total output. That's everything from new home construction to renovations, landscaping, and even real estate agent commissions on sales. At even a 15% rate, America is arguably already overexposed to this highly speculative industry. But in China, that number is 30%. 30% of China's output and an equally large portion of its growth over the past decades have been fueled by housing. That's because, like infrastructure, housing is a really easy way to boost employment and household spending. Construction always requires a large amount of labour and people treat spending on new homes very differently than they would spending on regular consumer items. Households in China have been willing to take on astronomical amounts of debt to buy apartments in poorly constructed buildings on top of land that belongs to the government. So far this system has been a win-win-win for all of the participants involved. Investors have seen the price of their homes skyrocket off the back of endless debt fueled speculation. Banks have been able to write huge loans to an industry that most believe the government wouldn't let fail. Provincial governments made lots of money by selling land use rights to developers. The developers made lots of money by building cheap houses that they could sell for astronomical prices. And the national government was happy because this merry-go-round of greed was great for employment and growth figures. But like all feedback loops, this was bound to end in disaster. And it has been. We have already made multiple other videos covering housing, debt and government taxation in China before, so I don't want to repeat too much here. But I do want to highlight that the collapse of this market is creating a panic that banks will not be able to honour withdrawals since they too are so heavily invested into the real estate market. Chinese citizens are now facing what was once unthinkable, which is that their homes, which represent their investments, savings, retirement plannings and their housing all in one, are now borderline unsellable, and that's if they're lucky enough to actually have a house. 
Developers are unable to finish projects that people have already paid for, more often than not with a combination of their own savings and a mortgage. Those people who are unlikely to get their houses are now refusing to pay their mortgages, which means banks are running out of cash even faster than they were before. In anticipation of cash shortages, people are going to withdraw their savings from at-risk institutions, which is only further accelerating the problem. This is a classic run on the banks, and most economists see this as basically financial Armageddon. So there we are. A housing market collapse at least twice as potent as the GFC, municipal bankruptcies, foreign investment breakdowns, failing infrastructure, trade wars, droughts, flooding, heatwaves, extended lockdowns, food shortages, civil unrest, industrial slowdowns, and bank runs. That's the brief list of things going wrong in China right now. This is to say nothing of an ageing population, a long-term loss of industrial competitive advantage, and the gradual decline towards a less business-friendly, more authoritarian government. We can ignore those factors for now, because again, we are just trying to work out if China's going to collapse in the next 27 days, or whatever. But with all of this going on at the same time, maybe it's more efficient to ask why China won't collapse. Now to explain this, we first have to define what a collapse is. If we are defining a collapse as the total breakdown of civil order, people marching in the streets, governments being deposed, something like the Arab Spring, in many ways there are some similarities. Those uprisings were kicked off by stagnating economic growth in Tunisia, and they were directed at authoritarian governments that were impeding on people's liberties. So it could very well collapse, in the same way that America could have collapsed during the GFC, or in the same way that anything could theoretically happen at any time. If government leadership gets backed into a corner and tries to do something like invade Taiwan, then yes, it's going to collapse and it will very quickly turn into a failed state. It's just extremely unlikely. We as economists also don't know what we don't know. There could be anything from further natural disasters to government infighting to an alien invasion that could cause the state to collapse, but that's not a situation unique to China, it's just that China is in a slightly more precarious situation at the moment. If I had to present a scenario probability report, this would be a 1% chance, where a regular economy might be a half percent chance, and something like Russia would be 25%. Another potential collapse situation wouldn't so much be a collapse in the traditional sense as a regression towards becoming a closed off, centrally planned economy again. We can in many ways already see this playing out. The country is becoming much more strict about who leaves and who enters. It has undeniably taken on a more nationalistic persona, and it's aligning itself with countries who are themselves getting cut off from the rest of the world. Now, I would argue that if this does happen, it will continue to be a very slow, very gradual decline rather than a collapse in the sense that China wakes up one day and realises that it's North Korea 2.0. It would also be much harder to pull off. One of the reasons having a wealthy population is so fantastic is that they have the capacity to be politically active. China's population, while still not wealthy by Western standards, is not living meal to meal like it was back when the country was closed off from the outside world. It's much harder to subjugate a population that has tasted wealth and freedom. Not impossible, but much harder. All right, now I've covered myself from the this didn't age well comments in the event that this whole situation actually does go south, it's probably better to look at some more realistic reasons why it probably won't. The first is that China can afford some economic setbacks. It has been home to the most intense period of economic growth in history. It has gone from a mostly agrarian backwater to the second largest economy in the world in the span of someone's working career. Lots of other countries have economic setbacks, and it's not too often that we see these devolve into outright revolution or anything of that nature. What's more is that a bit of an economic slowdown might be exactly what the country needs. Modern economies run on the business cycle. This is a rough pattern of booms and busts with a frequency of around a decade. This pattern is mostly caused by debt. When on average people are taking on debt, the economy does really well. And then when on average people are paying off or defaulting on their debt, the economy slows down a bit. Now while those slowdowns might be painful, if well managed, they play a really important role in the long-term health of an economy. Downturns weed out underperforming businesses, products and employees as everybody is forced to cut down to the essentials, which means that only the most competitive, value-adding and efficient entities survive. I understand on a human level that sounds terrible, but long term it means that the economy can bounce back stronger, which is a big part of the reason why, on average, this cycle of booms and busts tends to trend upwards over time. A pullback in the Chinese economy, again, if managed properly, could be a huge opportunity for the economy to shift away from its over-dependence on real estate and infrastructure and focus more on value-adding industries like high-tech manufacturing, research and development, tourism and finance. The Chinese economy is also a lot more robust than most economists are giving it credit for. 
This might be confusing, especially since I said a lot of the biggest industries are built on very shaky foundations, but these two factors are not mutually exclusive. Its real estate and infrastructure industries are crumbling, literally and figuratively. But the Chinese government is more than capable of controlling the damage from these issues in the short term. China has the most foreign currency reserves of any nation in the world by a huge margin. This means that in a worst case scenario, it could completely hold off bank runs just by printing more money and dispersing it through a series of state owned banks. Normally this would cause inflation, but China can afford that right now. One positive side effect of all of this consumer hesitancy is that China is not having the same problem with inflation that a lot of other countries in the West are. The Chinese central bank has actually bucked the global trend and is lowering interest rates at the moment in the hopes of offsetting some of the pain caused by the collapse of the housing market. It can further prevent this having any knock-on effects by using its foreign currency reserves to protect the value of its currency so that it doesn't end up like Turkey or Venezuela. It turns out having a $3.4 trillion pile of money is also very effective in shoring up food security as well. China already imports more food than it exports, and if it needs to spend a little bit of extra money on making sure that its citizens are fed, it's going to be more than happy to do so, knowing the alternative. There are also the non-economic factors. Of course, this is outside of my specific area of expertise, but the Chinese population does not have the same opportunity for regime-changing levels of civil unrest. The government is authoritarian and they monitor everybody very closely. People will no doubt voice their frustrations, especially if they are in a situation where they are not going to get a house that they have paid for, but these protests are not directed at the government or the country. If anything, they are a very public way for these people to ask their government to bail them out of a situation that they have found themselves in. Chances are the government probably will bail them out too. People are happy to give up a lot of liberties if it means that they are getting rich. But in many cases, entire families have pulled their life savings of multiple generations to afford modest homes that won't be delivered. The government is likely to do what it does best and invest into building projects to soften the blow of this economic downturn. Only now, instead of building roads to nowhere, it has the opportunity to build something that really is in demand, and that is the housing that people have already paid for. It's another win-win. It will provide economic stimulus at a time when the country actually needs it, and it will avoid a situation where tens of millions of people have nothing to lose. The kinds of situations that tend to get a bit revolutionary. Okay, well, even if all of these issues won't cause a total collapse of the Chinese economy, surely they at least spell the end of the Chinese miracle. Most reasonable economists are predicting that these issues are going to cause the end of strong sustained growth in China. Most of them point to the experiences of Japan, which was another country that grew rapidly thanks to mass manufacturing and strong exports. Their competitive advantage eventually faded away as their population became wealthier, and they started to lose a lot of their manufacturing to places like China. They also had an overinflated housing market that dragged the economy down and caused a prolonged period of economic stagnation. Japan also suffers from an aging population. Sure, China's was caused by direct government intervention and Japan's was more socio-economic, but the result is going to be the same. Too many old unproductive people to look after and not enough young productive people to take their place. The parallels between Japan and China are truly remarkable, and I can see why economists are saying that this is the direction the country is headed towards. But they are probably not correct, at least in the way that you would think they are. China and Japan had very similar growth trajectories, they faced very similar challenges, they even worked in very similar industries. But China is not Japan. For starters, China is still much poorer than Japan was in the early 1990s when its stagnation began. Yes, there is some fabulous wealth in concentrated city centres, but this is not the experience of most Chinese citizens. In 1995, Japan had a GDP per capita of $45,000. Today, almost 30 years later, China has a GDP per capita of $10,500. Yes, Japan's economy has stagnated, with no real sustained GDP growth being experienced over the past 30 years. And yes, it's dealt with stagnation pretty well. It's still a very stable, safe and productive economy that provides a good standard of living to its citizens. If China's economy was to stagnate now, it wouldn't be any of those things because most people would still be very poor by global standards. China is also a much more corrupt and less representative country than Japan was. Since the end of the Second World War, Japan has been a functioning democracy. And while they have been overwhelmingly represented by a single party through the years, the people have the choice and the power to vote that party out if they see fit. That is a luxury that Chinese citizens do not have, which means that if the sentiment of the people shifts in the direction of wanting change, they do not have an easy and frankly non-violent way to pursue that change. 
there is a very good chance that if China was a regular democracy that the Communist Party would be continually re-elected. Say what you will about a lot of their actions on the world stage and authoritarian antics, but for the majority of their people the last 30 years under their rule have been very rewarding. People are willing to put up with a lot if they can see their living conditions improving, but historically economic conditions have been one of the primary deciding factors of if governments get re-elected or not. And if the people can't vote their government out, tensions are bound to start building up. The amount of power and lack of oversight that the government has also means that corruption is just a way of life in China. Now in a weird way, some of this corruption has actually helped the economy grow because businesses can cut through a lot of red tape with a small bribe or two. Polymatter did a great video on this topic, so go and watch that if you want more details there. Corruption may very well have helped the economy grow, but if the economy is not growing, corruption will eat it alive. Paying a bribe or two to a government official to look the other way on zoning laws or factory pollution standards will have negative consequences, but not the type that gets paid for with money. If foreign investment stops, industry slows down and new projects get halted, then corrupt officials won't have the same opportunities to make money through simply opening doors, so they'll be forced to take money by stealing it from the people. Now you know the line, nobody can predict the future, least of all economists. But if I was a betting man, which I'm not, my predictions would be that China doesn't end up looking like Japan, but ends up looking more like other countries that have become very wealthy very quickly, but that wealth didn't translate into a sustainable economic model. Not a collapse, but more of a slow, stable decline. If you want the real reason that you've been seeing headlines about China being on the brink of collapse, then prepare to be disappointed. The reality is that someone out there made a video with a thumbnail that said something to the effect of 34 days until China collapses. It's complete nonsense, but it got millions of views. Other creators saw the success of this video and used the same clickbait titles to bring in as many viewers as possible on their own videos. Some of these videos were themselves nonsense, and some were genuinely great commentary on the issues. No hate. I understand the game better than most people. If you put a lot of effort into making a video, you want to make sure that people watch it. Let's let this be the takeaway. China is in a difficult economic situation at the moment, no doubt. But an outright collapse in the second largest economy in the world with high levels of control over a quasi-reserve currency and very little patience for public dissent is very unlikely. It's important not to let the understandable animosity we might feel towards the CCP affect the way that we interpret news about them. If any of you have read these headlines or watched these videos and sensed a feeling of joy or superiority over the fact that the bad guys are finally getting what's coming to them, then no shame. I'll be honest, I enjoy a bit of schadenfreude as well. But please consider two things. Were you more likely to accept the fact that these headlines were true because you wanted them to be true? And if so, I encourage you to go back and read them as if they were talking about your own country. I think that a lot of you would be less likely to take the predictions at face value. Also, this is perhaps the most important part of the video, which is that you don't want China to collapse. Never mind the mostly innocent citizens of the country that are just trying to make a better life for themselves, even if we think about this from a purely selfish point of view, the second largest economy in the world collapsing would do a lot of collateral damage. China is a large buyer of material exports from countries like Australia, Japan, the EU and the US. Losing that export market would cause steep downturns in any of these economies. China also produces a lot of the products that we use in our daily lives at a price point that we have become accustomed to. If you want to turn the inflation that we have been experiencing at the moment from a problem to a crisis, then cut off Chinese exports without time to arrange an alternative supplier. Finally, a collapse is not going to solve any of China's problems. Even if the government ceased to exist in a somehow totally peaceful way, there would be a massive power vacuum that was likely only to be filled by another authoritarian regime. Anybody who has watched my channel for long enough will know that I am not a fan of the Chinese government. But a collapse is not the mechanism to bring about productive change. Instead, what we should all be hoping for is a slow, gradual shift towards a system that is more open to the international community and less suspicious of its own citizens. Thanks for watching, mate. Bye.